The great green gamble. The Prime Minister set to delay key climate change targets. Conservative critics have called Rishi Sunak's change of heart his greatest mistake and a moment of shame. The car giant Ford said any delay to the ban on new petrol and diesel cars would be bad for business certainty. I think it's a really dubious proposition that this wins uh, the Conservatives more votes. And ultimately, we're not going to save the planet by bankrupting the British people. We'll get more reaction and the latest from the government ahead of the Prime Minister's big speech on his new net zero plans later today. Also ahead. Charged with murder, the police officer who shot dead the unarmed Chris Cabber a year ago. A surprise fall in inflation will get reaction on what it means for the Bank of England's decision on interest rates tomorrow. Under the hammer, how Hollywood stars are helping those out of work because of the writer's strike with a special auction. And touchdown, the king and queen arrive in Paris six months after their royal visit was postponed due to rioting. This is the ITV Lunchtime News with Nina Hussain. Good afternoon. In a few hours' time, the Prime Minister will tell us why he has changed his mind on the government's climate change commitments. But even before the detail and the reasons become clear, the backlash has begun. Rishi Sunak has angered not only Green campaigners, but many in his own party, and some businesses, including Ford and the energy company E.ON. The former Environment Minister Lord Goldsmith said his short stint as Prime Minister will be remembered as the moment the UK turned its back on the world and on future generations. So why consider delaying key targets, like the ban on new petrol and diesel cars in 2030, in a year when the world has seen yet more evidence of the climate emergency? His Home Secretary indicated today it's all about the financial costs to individuals, saying we're not going to save the planet by bankrupting the British people. Our political correspondent, Carl Dinnan, has the latest. Rishi Sunak is expected to say that motorists will be able to pump fossil fuels into their cars for longer. He's believed to be considering watering down a raft of green measures in time for a hastily arranged press conference this afternoon. What will end up being announced is not clear. We need to take a pragmatic approach, one which is proportionate and in line with our priorities of economic growth, uh, dealing with the cost of living challenges, protecting household budgets and ultimately we're not going to save the planet by bankrupting the British people. The motor industry, already spending millions to prepare for the end of petrol and diesel car sales by 2030, has responded angrily. The chair of Ford UK wrote, our business needs three things from the UK government, ambition, commitment and consistency. A relaxation of 2030 would undermine all three. Smaller businesses are equally annoyed. From my business, which is a small business, uh, and there are many small businesses in this space, investing in innovation uh, is extremely frustrating because all the investments we're making now may or may not be uh, the right thing to do, and it slows all of us down. Although the Tories may have won the Uxbridge by-election by opposing charges for more polluting cars, many in Rishi Sunak's own party think watering down longer-term green commitments is a big mistake. I think it's a really dubious proposition that this wins uh, the Conservatives more votes. All the evidence shows that Conservative voters really strongly believe in the net zero uh, project, certainly uh, in Redwall seats, which stand to benefit from thousands of new manufacturing jobs, that's the case. The 2030 petrol and diesel car target may now be a dividing line between the two main parties. We do support the 2030 target and British business had been gearing up to meet that target. Only last week Conservative ministers were signing off hundreds of millions of pounds of subsidy to help businesses get ready for that. And on the other targets we just don't know whether they've been confirmed or not. What the government is planning to do with its green energy policies should become clearer later today when the Prime Minister delivers his rapidly rearranged speech. 
Carl, how big a gamble is this for the Prime Minister? Well, I think this is a huge gamble for Rishi Sunak. First of all, it has to be said, we don't know exactly what he's going to announce. And on the bare bones of what we've heard, this watering down of green policies, some Tories do love it. But a number of Conservative MPs are very angry about this. I, you've already heard that business is annoyed about it. It's not just the car industry. This is the energy giant E.ON's chief exec, Chris Norbury. He says, we risk condemning people to many more years of living in cold, drafty homes that are expensive to heat in cities clogged with dirty air. And then there are the voters. I mean, there is no great evidence that voters want these things scrapped. Uh, the net zero target, 2050. Rishi Sunak says that's staying in place. Three quarters of voters support that. But 50 percent of voters don't think that the government is doing enough on climate change. He risks alienating them. And then finally, he also risks his own reputation for being competent. The last 24 hours have looked pretty panicky. Uh, we're going to end up with this hastily rearranged speech. His USP has been that he's not Boris Johnson, he's not Liz Truss, he's a safe pair of hands. That also now looks very much at risk. Carl Dinan, thank you. Well, that speech is set to take place at Downing Street at 4.30. And ahead of that big speech, uh, what's the latest on the climate crisis? Well, throughout this summer, ITV has covered the issue extensively from around the world, from coral bleaching to wildfires to extreme heat and drought to climate change leading to migration. Our correspondents have shared their personal experiences. You can watch that special report on ITVX. Just scroll down to the news section. The Metropolitan Police officer who shot an unarmed man a year ago has been charged with murder. Chris Cabber died after he was struck by a single bullet when he was driving in South London. The officer who is not yet being named is due to appear in court tomorrow. The announcement by the Crown Prosecution Service follows an investigation by the police watchdog. Sejal Karia is with me and has been following the case. How rare is it for a police officer to be charged over a killing? It's rare. There have only been 12 cases where an officer has been charged with murder or manslaughter in the last 20 years uh, after a death in or following police custody in England and Wales. In this case, as you say, the officer has not been identified. He's only been known as NX one to one. Now they aren't being publicly uh, named as is usually the case when someone's been charged because we're told they intend to make an application for anonymity when they appear at court tomorrow. Now Chris Cabber was just months away from being a father when he was shot through a windscreen of the Audi he was driving in South London just over a year ago. He was unarmed and the car did not belong to him and at the time he was being followed by an unmarked police car that didn't have its sirens or its lights on. He turned into a narrow residential street, which was already being blocked by a marked police car, when an officer fired once, hitting him in the head. Now, following his death, hundreds of people took to the streets across the country to protest, many of them hugely angry, particularly uh, particular anger amongst black communities. How has Chris Cabber's family reacted now to this latest development in the case? Well, they have welcomed the charging decision and they say that it could not have come too soon. In an interview a couple of weeks ago with ITV News, his mother Helen and his father Prosper called for justice for their son. Chris was unarmed. Chris was driving normally. And why should he be shot? Why should he be killed? Now, the Metropolitan Police has called today's news a significant and serious development. Sajil Karia, thank you very much. Thank you. The rate of inflation has slightly eased this month against predictions it was due to rise above 7% once again. Figures from the Office for National Statistics shows a surprise fall for August to 6.7%. That's down from 6.8% in July. The government says the drop shows it's on track to meet its target of around 
5% by the end of the year. A slowdown in food prices and a drop in airfare and hotel costs for the end of the summer are said to be behind the drop. Our economics editor, Joel Hills, joins us now from West London. Joel, what could this mean for the interest rates decision expected tomorrow? Well, let's look at the facts. The headline rate of inflation was expected to rise last month. It fell. Two other very important measures of inflation, core inflation, which strips out food and energy prices, and services inflation, which measures surplus prices in the services sector of the economy, also fell by more than was expected. These are very happy and welcome surprises. And they are evidence which suggests that what we may well be experiencing finally is a broad-based, sustainable slowdown in price rises. Food prices, you mentioned there, food inflation eased. Prices in restaurants fell last month. The owner of this restaurant, though, reminds everyone who speaks to him that the headline rate of inflation is still three times the bank's target rate. The Bank of England, we know, is worried about pay growth in the economy, which remains very strong. We're seeing oil prices tick up. I think yesterday the markets were betting that there would be an interest rate rise uh, tomorrow. Now they're not so sure. The odds are 50-50. And on the issue of inflation going in the right direction at the moment from the latest figures, that's one thing. But in reality, most people won't be feeling better off right now. Why is that? Well, a lot of people won't. You're absolutely right. That's because inflation is falling, but prices obviously are not. Food inflation is still running at 13%. That's brutal. The Joseph Rowntree Foundation calculates there are about 7 million low-income households in the UK who can no longer afford really the bare essentials, whether it's goods or services. Businesses, though, are being hurt too. Business groups have been lining up this morning to say that their members are struggling to service debts and in some cases uh, are struggling to obtain new loans. They're urging the Bank of England to pause what the the IOD, the Institute of Directors and the British Chambers of Commerce and the Federation of Small Businesses would argue is we've reached a point now where raising interest rates further carries a far greater risk than actually pausing, which is what they want the bank to do. Joel Hills, thank you very much. Thank you. Next this lunchtime, junior doctors have joined consultants on the picket line in England in the first double walkout in the history of the NHS. Patients face the biggest disruption during the dispute so far, as staff from both roles strike delivering only emergency care. Tomorrow, junior doctors will strike again until 7am on Saturday. In a moment, we'll be live with our reporter Max Walsh, who is at the Bristol Royal Infirmary. First, let's go to Chloe Keady, who's at the Royal Preston Hospital in Preston. Chloe, what's the situation like there today? Well, Nina, we've spent the morning in the emergency department and I can tell you it is busy in there. They've got about 50 beds, about 60 patients that need seeing to at the moment. But everyone kept telling me, look, this is absolutely par for the course. Just because there's a strike on, emergency care is one thing that really can't stop. And they are staffed for that. They're operating what's called Christmas Day uh, levels of cover, which means that even though there's a strike on, some doctors still have to come in to maintain safe levels of staffing. Where you really do notice the impact more is in other parts of the hospital. So we spoke to one uh, consultant who works on the acute respiratory ward. That's only got skeleton staffing today. He did manage to get off the ward for a few hours this morning to carry out a few urgent procedures that simply couldn't wait. But he said that for every one of those urgent procedures, there are about 10 planned procedures that have had to be cancelled. And he said the problem is once you start uh, cancelling procedures, that causes other problems, like it takes longer to discharge people from hospital. And that, of course, has a knock-on effect on other parts of the hospital, like the emer emergency department. Well, I'm outside the Bristol Royal Infirmary, where junior doctors have walked out for the sixth time this year, but joined by consultants for the first time in this unprecedented action. I was speaking to the BMA reps a little bit earlier, who were holding a picket line in this driving rain, and they describe uh, what was going on inside, a bit like what Chloe was just saying, as Christmas cover, essentially what you'd expect in a bank holiday. But when you speak to people going in and out of the hospital today, they all come up with the same word, and that is it is 
quite quiet in there. One person I spoke to was visiting his granddaughter undergoing spinal surgery. He told me that she was one of the only patients in the entire ward. Clearly what we're not seeing are those people affected by the cancellation of those routine appointments and surgeries. Bosses here will, I think, be relatively pleased with how A&E is coping. They've urged people to stay away as long as they only come in for life-threatening care. But I think what we will see, uh, only the impact of this, uh, of this action in the coming days and weeks ahead uh, when there are more strikes and growing waiting lists. Max Walsh and Chloe Keady, thank you very much. Thank you. New research shared exclusively with ITV News shows that, on average, a family is evicted every eight minutes in England from privately rented accommodation. The figures from Shelter are for no-fault eviction notices. The, that rate is the equivalent of 172 families being made homeless every day. Our investigations correspondent, Daniel Hewitt, is here. Daniel, what impact is this having on children? Oh, it, enormous. Um, and potentially devastating. As part of this report, we went to one school in South London, where they're, a primary school, where they've got over 300 children. Over half of those children are homeless in temporary accommodation in one school. It's a problem getting worse. It's clearly impacting their education, clearly impacting their mental health, both now and potentially in the future. Mm -hmm. And the uncertainty that sort of defines their life is getting worse. Shelter have also done a, a survey of private, rent, uh, private renters in England, and the numbers are pretty stark. I think we can show them for you now. And 40% of private renters they surveyed show that um, it took them over two months to find somewhere new once they were uh, evicted because there's such a shortage of property at the moment. 51% fear losing the home that they're currently in right now. And 61% said they could not afford to stay where they are if the landlord increased the rent by 10%. And lots of landlords are increasing it by much more than 10%. I was speaking to a family in uh, Stockport in Greater Manchester, Zara and her two children. They were served a no-fault eviction. Uh, I think we can show you the pictures now of them in the guest house they've been placed in um, in, in, in Manchester um, from, from Stockport where they were living uh, and they right now have nowhere to go and um, they can't afford to rent where they are and this is the impact Zara told us on, on her and the family. Even though it was no fault eviction it, it, you can't help but feel like, um, like a failure and when you're placed in somewhere like the place where we've been put it's like reinforcing that it's like saying yeah you are you, you, you not scum, but you are like the lowest of the low because that's all you're worthy of, that's all your children are worthy of. Dan, what can be done? Well, Shelter and other housing campaigners say the government has to bring forward quickly and right now its private renters reform bill to ban no-fault evictions. They also want to see housing benefit increased in line with the price of current rent right now. I understand from the government sources that the government still plans to bring forward that legislation. It still wants to ban no-fault evictions, but it's likely to be at least at earliest before Christmas before they bring that legislation in. Daniel Hewitt, thank you. Thank you. The king and queen have arrived in Paris for their delayed state visit. Their original tour had to be scrapped because riots broke out over a rise in the state pension age. They're at the Arc de Triomphe right now, along with President Macron and his wife. Our royal editor, Chris Schiff, is there too. Chris, what is this visit all about? Yes, hi Nina. You join us just at the very moment, actually, that uh, King Charles and Queen Camilla arrive here at the uh, Place de Charles de Gaulle, perhaps more famous for the uh, giant landmark in the middle of it, the Arc de Triomphe, where they're being welcomed by the French President Emmanuel Macron. As you say, this is the second time they've tried to arrange this visit, uh, and this one, uh, this time round, uh, is all going to plan. Uh, Charles and Camilla, the King and Queen, have just been driven up the uh, Champs Elysees, and there'll be a small uh, ceremony to welcome them here to France for this. Uh, state visit over the next couple of days. They've got time here in uh, Paris uh, as well as uh, in Bordeaux. And some of the remarks, the speeches that the King will make will be in French. Nina, if you cast your mind back to when uh, the King and Queen went to Germany earlier this year, uh, diplomats at the Foreign Office still talk about how that helped to uh, grease the diplomatic wheels and they're still benefiting from the uh, economic upturn as a result uh, of that visit. 
You know, this is a lot about um, repairing some of the damage of relations that were caused by uh, the Brexit referendum. And uh, the visit here by the King and Queen is meant to show that, yes, we did leave the European Union, but we're still your neighbours uh, and we are still your friends. You can hear the uh, British national anthem being played uh, at this very moment for their arrival. Let's pause and have a short listen. Uh, the visit will last until Friday afternoon when they uh, fly home from Bordeaux. Chris, thank you. Finally, how the Hollywood stars are helping the behind-the-scenes workers during the writer's strike production at some big studios was halted more than four months ago in a dispute over pay and the use of artificial intelligence, but the shutdown means no work for crew members. So some of the big names have auctioned off some of their movie memorabilia and their own time. Here's Faye Barker. Come and get me, boys. An auction of glittering items and experiences. From a video call with Nicole Kidman. I believe you were expecting me. To owning one of the Hawaiian shirts worn by Daniel Radcliffe as Weird Al. Oh, my little hungry one. Hungry one. Or you may fancy a script signed by the stars of The Lost Boys. How are those maggots? <laughs> It's no surprise that any of these things are worth thousands and the money raised is for workers affected by the strikes in Hollywood. Over 50 goods and services are up for grabs on eBay. Writers, directors and actors are supporting crew members who've lost health insurance due to studio shutdowns. Sag after strong. The writers' strike began back in May in a row with studio bosses over pay and the use of artificial intelligence. Actors joined the cause in July, meaning many productions, including some in the UK, have shut down. Negotiations are due to restart today, but the row has affected workers across the industry. A bespoke pet portrait by John Lithgow alone is expected to raise thousands for the cause. Another popular item with bidders is having your dog walked by Adam Scott. Hi. So while many can't do their usual jobs, this is a quirky and creative way to support those who need it the most. Faye Barker, ITV News. That's it for now. Mary is back with the evening news at 6.30 from everybody on today's lunchtime team and from me. Bye-bye.